the data collection methods used are standardized across all sites to enable comparisons across the continent. As a result, the data can be used to integrate ecological observations across multiple scales, detect changes in how our ecosystems function, and enable forecasting of environmental change to inform resource management decisions. NEON field sites are strategically located in both terrestrial and freshwater aquatic ecosystems across the United States. They represent the vegetation, landforms, and climates of those regions. At each field site, NEON uses a combination of automated instruments, observational sampling, and airborne remote sensing technologies to collect data that characterize plants, animals, soils, nutrients, freshwater, and atmosphere. NEON's automated instruments collect data 24-7 at terrestrial and aquatic field sites across the nation. Flux towers that rise above the plant canopy at terrestrial sites collect a full profile of atmospheric measurements along with sensors installed in the ground that monitor soil health. At aquatic sites, a smaller meteorological station collects atmospheric data and other sensors monitor surface water and groundwater quality. In addition to instrument systems, NEON has trained field technicians that conduct standardized sampling throughout the growing season at dozens of plot locations within each field site. They collect organismal and biogeochemical observations that range from plants and animals to soil microbes and aquatic life. Morphology maps of the aquatic field sites are collected, as well as hydrology data to monitor physical changes that occur over time. During peak greenness, NEON's airborne observation platform is flown over field sites to collect hyperspectral, LIDAR, and high-resolution camera data. These remote sensing systems capture changes to land characteristics like topography, as well as more complex processes like tree growth and forest health across an entire site from year to year. The data collected through these three systems can be studied in conjunction with one another because they're gathered in close proximity to each other at a site. The data are also comparable among field sites, so researchers can study connections and patterns across ecosystems, and then develop models to forecast environmental change locally, regionally, and at a continental scale. NEON is an open science program, which means all NEON data, protocols, and resources are freely available online for anyone to use. Explore neonscience.org to learn more. So NEON's really exciting to me as a data scientist because they have so much data um, and they have a lot of sensors in their fields that are collecting data pretty often. Um, however, as we all know, one thing that happens when you get a lot of data is it can slow down a lot of your computational resources, especially if you're trying to do any analyses on your own laptop. Um, and so that's where I think some of the high performance computing capabilities that EMSL offers can really come in handy. Um, for example, one of the things that NEON does is look at phenology cameras. These are cameras that are set up at their sites that take a picture about once an hour and have done so for years where you can actually look at uh, differences in like the amount of greenness on trees. Um, so just one more video and it'll be the last one for this tutorial, but it's a good introduction to how these phenology cameras work. What do human eyes have in common with a handheld camera or a camera mounted on a satellite in space? Well, human eyes and cameras can both capture the timing of when plants grow buds, leaf out, flower, fruit, and die back the science known as plant phenology. But why do we need fancy cameras to study phenology if we can see it with our own eyes? Let's first talk about why we study phenology. You see, scientists have used their eyes to record when plants bud, leaf out, flower, and fruit for centuries. These annual plant life cycle events known as phenophases are often triggered by seasonal changes in rainfall, temperature, and day length. 
Their timing is important to study because it's impacted by changes in climate. And impacts on phenophase timing by climate can impact humans, plants, and animals too. For example, scientists have observed that some plants are leafing out earlier in recent years. This means that fruit trees and crops that we depend upon for food might bud and flower earlier in the season, leaving them at risk for damage during spring frosts. Birds that depend upon those flowers and fruits are also impacted when they can't find those mid-migration snacks that they flew so far to eat. The importance of phenology is why NEON scientists and citizen scientists involved with Project Budburst and Nature's Notebook are recording phenophase dates at locations across the country. With lots of data collected by lots of people, we can track changes in timing of specific phenophases for our plants each year. However, our eyes can only observe so many plants. How do we track the timing of phenophase events across a state, a country, or even the globe? To measure more plants over larger areas, we need to view the forest above the trees at a different scale. Imagine what our human eyes would see standing in a treehouse looking across the top of a forest. From this view, we can see lots of trees, but maybe not each individual bud and leaf on a tree. We can capture that treehouse view using cameras designed for tracking phenology, called phenocams. Phenocams are placed in fixed locations and are programmed to take pictures of specific areas every day. This spares us humans from having to man the treehouse day and night, recording what we see. Projects like NEON and the Phenocam Network have these cameras set up at locations across the United States. Phenocams record whether a plant is green or brown, just like our eyes do. But a camera can take a picture of a whole lot of plants at one time. This allows us to estimate phenophase events across huge areas, including entire sections of forest and grasslands. A camera records the amount of green or brown being reflected from those plants too, something our eyes can see but not assign a numeric value to. So, as plants turn green in the spring, the amount of brightness of green in the image increases, and when the plant turns brown in the fall, the camera will record that too. If we plot the amount of green on every graph, we can tell when the trees begin to turn green and when they are the most green. We can also tell when they begin to turn brown and when they lose their leaves or die back for the winter. Over time, we can compare the dates of plants turning green in the spring and dying back and losing their leaves in the fall to see if the dates change significantly from year to year. But what if we want to measure phenology across an entire state or country? Well, imagine what you'd see if you were sitting on a satellite looking down on the Earth from space. From space, we can't see individual buds or leaves, or even individual trees. However, we can measure the greenness and brownness of groups of plants. Rather than send lots of humans to space to record this, we use high-powered scientific cameras mounted on satellites orbiting the Earth. Like many phenocams, satellite cameras like Landsat and MODIS can be used to measure greenness and brownness too. And because they are further away from the Earth, they can take images of larger areas on the ground, recording the greening and browning of plants across entire states and countries across the world. To sum this all up, phenology is the study of the timing of life cycle events like the opening of leaves or flowers on a plant. The timing of plant phenophases helps us understand how changes in climate like temperature and precipitation impact plants, animals, and as humans too. We can measure the timing for individual plants and phenophases with our eyes and a notepad, but we need cameras mounted on platforms above the forests and satellites in space to estimate this timing across larger areas. And that is how and why we measure phenology over large areas. All right, so again, brief introduction to NEON and their phenology cameras. Um, so I got some data looking at one of the cameras in Acadia National Park, um, and the pictures look like this. You can see it's really green and we're looking over a pretty wide field of view. And then we can take that picture and plot out what's the amount of blue in the picture or green or red. And we can get these numeric values from it like if you use the color mixer in PowerPoint. And you can see the amount of red, green, and blue. You can also get the relative intensities of all of these by taking, for instance, the amount of green 
divided by the total amount of red, green, and blue. And using that, we can create a plot that shows the amount of green up over time. So you can see, for example, when spring might start, when the peak greenness is reached, and when we're down into fall and winter where there's no more green. I wanted to showcase a couple of links, but there is this really nice PhenoCam website where you can actually go and download all of this data. So wanted to bring it up here. And this is what the PhenoCam website looks like. There are lots of tutorials and information about this website that you can find. You can also go to data and find something that looks like this, where you can input a whole bunch of different sites that they have, which are, I mean, literally hundreds of them. Um, a start date and an end date for when you want to download pictures from, and the start time of day and end time of day. What's really nice about this is if you just wanted a brief look at a whole year, you could, for example, take one picture from every day that year, or take all of the pictures taken at noon, or just look at the 15th day of every month to try and subsample your data to a lower dimension so that it makes it easier to handle. But when you do that, you can get a whole bunch of pictures that look at the same spot over time to try to look at the differences in greenness that you can see. And again, then you can go and make a plot like this so you can figure out what the amount of green is, uh, when uh, spring and peak greenness and autumn tend to happen. Um, you can also go within and then check if you have any outliers and see what happened with that, if the camera is down or if it's really foggy that day or whatnot. So what I did was download a bunch of pictures um, over the year in Acadia National Park. Because there were quite a lot of pictures, I think over 4,000 for this year, uh, I subsampled and only gave you about a quarter of the pictures that were taken over the whole year. With this, using a few different packages in R, we can go ahead and go and calculate the amount of greenness in a sample. So for example, if we look at this picture, which is the one I have here, and it's one that I just randomly chose to use as a reference. I should say that most of what I'm doing in here is using the PhenoPix package in R. And if you look at the PhenoCam uh, website and go ahead and look at the different image analysis tools, this is one of the ones that they recommend. I picked R because that's what I do most of my experience and most of my coding in, uh, but they obviously have different ones from MATLAB or Python if you want to use a different language. There is the CRAN website for the PhenoPix package where you can go and learn all about it. And they also have vignettes that will walk you through how to use their package. But back to the code, the first thing that we need to do is be able to draw a region of interest. So maybe we don't want to use this entire picture to look at greenness because the amount of sky in this picture is going to mess up our totals at the end. So we can use this handy function, draw multi ROI, and then go ahead and click on the different points in our picture so that we can create this big region of interest. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a polygon in here and close it up. And then you can see where I'm drawing this region and what I want to look at for calculating a bunch of these vegetation indices or like the amount of green in the picture later on. And yes, I am done with this. Then we can load that data in and show it on the screen again. 
again, this is just a check that we make sure we know where our region of interest is and that we're happy with it. You'll notice when you look at all of these pictures that they're all formatted the same way with the site name and then the time and date this picture was taken. And we're going to use this time and date in, for our plotting. So we wanna make sure we understand the format of it. We have the four uh, digit year code, the two digit month code, the two digit date code, and then the time of day. Now we can actually get to this um, extract VIs function. And this is going to extract our vegetation indices from it. Um, so this is going to go through all of the files. I should have uh, routed to this earlier, my bad. but all of these different pictures and calculate the amount of green over time so that we can better figure out when spring is happening, when peak greenness is happening, and when things are dying out. It also has this end cores line in here. This is a lot of pictures and a lot of data that the function is looping through. And we want to be able to speed this up as much as we can. So you can use the number of cores available on your computer and that will definitely speed it up. So if I set this to two cores and run it right now, it's going to keep working on it until it's completed. Uh, I have not tried running this using CUDA, um, so I can't give a very good answer there. I imagine that there is something similar that you could run, if not this package exactly, uh, but probably. And so obviously when you're looking through all of this data, it is pretty easy to subsample and get the amount of data that you're looping in down to a more reasonable number. And I really recommend doing that the first couple of times that you're running this, at least so you make sure that your code works and you're not spending hours waiting for your code to run only to find out that you had an error somewhere or didn't know where you were saving your output to. But I'm a data scientist, so I like having as much data as possible. So I, I really hate the subsampling and I want to use all of it. I think it makes for better models. I think it makes you better able to understand your data. And I just like looking at more. However, as you can see, even when only looking at a quarter of the data taken within a year, this can take a little bit of time to run. And it can take quite a bit of your computer while you're doing it. It makes it kind of hard to do other things while you're just waiting for the code to run. But while this is running, does anybody else have any questions that they would like to ask? You can put it in the chat or I think you should be able to unmute yourself as well. All right, I can just keep rambling away. How do you deal with the camera moving in the wind or other natural changes? That is a great question. Uh, Neon has people pretty nearby most of these sites and they can go out and reposition the camera when they need to. Um, I am by no means an expert on all of these phenology cameras. Um, I think they also have some controls on it um, from afar that they are able to reposition. Um, but for the most part, in my admittedly brief look, uh, things are pretty good at keeping things in a stable position. Neon's really great with their quality control and data quality.
I swear this only takes about four minutes to run. Four minutes just seems like forever when you're doing a live demo. And this would be the time that my computer breaks. So <laughs> I'll give it another minute or so and hopefully we'll actually have a result to look through. Uh, if not, I'll just go ahead and cancel it. I've run this before, so it should all work. Should be the operative word. Somebody earlier today called me brave for doing a live demo. I thanked him for not calling me stupid, but you know, here we go. Anyway, the reason I wanted to show this and show doing it on a computer is just to show that, that you can, right? You can do this on a computer and it's totally fine. You can let it run overnight. Um, you can subsample down your data. There are a lot of different things that you can do in order to actually make this something that you can run on your computer. However, what we can do is also run this using our high performance computing resources at EMSL. And so I'm going to go and go back to my PowerPoint. Um, so you can see when I ran this previously, um, it took just over four minutes to be able to run this whole thing. And that's using 782 images, one region of interest, and two cores. Another way that we can do this would be to use our high performance computing system. At EMSL, that is called Tahoma, and that is our heterogeneous supercomputing uh, cluster. We also have a lot of data management tools, including Aurora, which is for data archiving, and Nexus, which handles project lifecycle management. We also have some cloud computing resources that we're starting to spin up. Um, and if you have any questions about any of those, please put them in the chat or feel free to email me and I would love to talk to you about them. But today I'm going to focus on Tahoma. Tahoma is 184 compute nodes and 24 analysis nodes. It's about 100 times faster than a desktop. And there's about 10 petabytes of clustered storage, which is shared amongst all of those nodes. For our regular compute nodes, each node has two CPUs, each with 18 cores, about 380 gigabytes of RAM, and two terabytes of flash storage. Our analysis nodes are, contain two GPUs and have a, one and a half terabytes of RAM, as well as eight terabytes of local storage. These are large memory nodes that can hold really large data sets and the GPGPUs accelerate vector and matrix math operations. However, we know that a lot of people aren't very familiar with working with these clusters. And especially, it can be hard to do a lot of this stuff when using just the command line. And so um, we have been working on this tool called Open On Demand. And Evan, Felix, and Ken Schmidt are on the line if you have questions for Open On Demand. They are the ones really pioneering the use of this at EMSL. But Open On Demand aims to soften the learning curve of HPC systems by providing various web-based modules to users. Uh, basically, you can go to Open On Demand and use a Jupyter Notebook like you would if you want to code in Python. You can use RStudio if you want to code in R. You can use Singularity if you want to make containerized scripts. Um, but it's a really nice way to go and get a desktop or a GUI that you can use so that you're actually coding on the cluster and using the cluster's resources, but you don't have to do anything in a command line. So going back to my code, it finally finished running. Yay. And we can go ahead and make a nice plot of it. But what I want to showcase now is Open On Demand. This is the website for Open On Demand where you can go and learn more information about it if you want to. 
and they have it set up. Currently, we are still working on getting this open for anybody to use. Um, so only special people get access to it. Um, they've graciously given me access to it for this tutorial. Um, but please work with us if this is something that you are interested in. We're making a lot of progress on it and are always adding new apps and trying to figure out ways to make this more useful to a wider variety of people. In here, you can see I've started a session. I only requested one node and one node had 36 cores. I also requested that this run for two hours because I wanted to set it up a little before the tutorial and make sure it ran through the tutorial itself. And this opened up our studio in a way that lets me use our studio, um, but on the cluster. What's cool about this is that you also have access to like your home directories on the cluster where you can upload all of the data that you want to use and be able to run different processes. So I can run the same code in here. For example, looking at this same image that we were doing beforehand and drawing our region of interest again. Make sure to load that up and we can see the ROI. And then I'm going to run using the exact same data that I had you download before. But you'll notice that in here, the number of cores I'm using is 36 instead of the two that my computer could handle without it crashing all the other things that I'm trying to run. This is obviously a lot more cores, and so it's able to handle a lot more data and do things a lot more quicker. And I need to stop saying a lot more, even I'm getting annoyed by that, so I apologize. But instead of taking four minutes, now this only took about 30 seconds, which is cool. So we can instead use a lot more data for example, if I want to use all of the data from this year, instead of only looking at a quarter of it, like I had previously. Or I've actually downloaded data from the last few years. And we can go ahead and take a look at that. Again, this will take a little bit longer to run. Um, and due to honestly procrastination on my part, I didn't get to run this as many times as I wanted to. Um, but if we go back to open on demand while that's running, again, you can see this clock countdown that I can see is really ominous, but is also really helpful for you to remind yourself that you are on a time limit when you're connected to this. This also shows that you can connect to just a desktop or a singularity containerized desktop, or you can use the Jupyter Notebook or our studio. There are other applications that the team is working on implementing, but that's what we've gotten so far. And I'm just excited that we have RStudio because that's what I like and what I use. But if we go and look at this folder, um, if it ever actually loads, you'll see, I think I have over 15,000 different images in here. Again, what's nice about this is I'm not using any of the storage on my personal computer to handle all of this. I'm able to take advantage of the storage on the cluster. I'm also not killing my computer when trying to run this because it's using the cluster in the background. But I'm really excited about this new adventure that we're going on in getting open on demand working. Uh, I personally know a lot of scientists and I myself can get a little intimidated by trying to use the command line to do anything. With this, we're able to use a whole bunch of different user interfaces and desktops um, and IDEs to be able to do these analyses. And 
I'm really excited as a step forward. So I know this is a really short tutorial, but I wanted to make sure I had a lot of time at the end so that people could let us know, you know, what packages or applications would you be excited to be able to do on the HPC system? And do you have any questions about how to get access um, or how to use it or anything like that? Or everybody's just tired because it's the last day in the last session. And while the talks have been really amazing, I'm drained. I don't know if anybody else is. I might have gotten overzealous in how much data I put in here. I got really excited about it, <laughs> but more for personal interest than for any real good uh, demonstration purposes. <laughs> hey, Allison, do you want to show them to, to bring up an actual desktop through yeah. the open on demand? Do this. Yeah, either one should work. I think there's more stuff installed in the Singularity one. OK. So when we start asking for an interactive session, um, it's going to say that it's queued. Um, at the moment, the wait time is pretty short, um, but it can take a little bit if a lot of people are wanting to use this at the same time, which I mean, for my purposes is the goal that a lot of people want to use this. Um, but we do have a way that this will email you when you're ready to actually launch your session. I mean, it's it's a direct. There's we've installed various applications in here, and you can run things right directly on the cluster. So if you go into the programming, I think is like the spider IDEs in there. Um, I think we've got rely on installed in here, but that's kind of a command line tool. But I mean, there's a Firefox right there. The other thing that was we really enjoyed when we first looked at this is. You can actually send a link to someone else and they can watch what you're doing. If you go back to the other page, you can kind of send them a link over there on the right. It says view only shareable link. So you could send that link to someone else and they could, you know, you could be on a call and they could be watching your tab through their web browser as well. There's nothing like live coding in front of other people. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that adrenaline rush will get you every time. Yeah, so um, see, Devin asked a question. Is it pretty straightforward to open a Jupyter Notebook? Yeah. We can go and you can use Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook and go ahead and launch another session. Um, and connect to it. And then you have Jupyter running just like normal. Evan, can you talk about updating packages? Um, so first I'm gonna ask in the next one, the GPU nodes can be accessed in a similar way. Um, I, we might have to put some tooling in there so that you can select them. Cause right now you're just kind of getting a node, but we could, there may be a partition. Ken can answer that, but you could just say. There's a partition on Tahoma. When we get this up and running on Tahoma, we'll be able to do that. I don't know if we've got that set up on Squim here. Okay. Um, updating packages in real time, uh, that gets really complicated based off what you run things through. Um, if you're updating them in your own home directory, you can do that you know, anytime. So if you're like installing packages for, for Python or for R, you, you can just do that in the environments. Um, the, the desktops are a little more challenging because they need to be pre-built right now. 
Um, so you can't just build a new one. Um, you're, this is also set up that those that really want to and get into it and want to fully understand on demand, you can build your own apps that run as your user on the cluster as you build them. That's how I do it myself. I just, as my, as my user, I create apps in my own home directory. And then once I get them to where I like them, then I can deploy them for the, the system as a whole. So that's really nice to be able to do that. Um, and there's, there's lots of different apps that people out in the, the community of the open on demand community have, have built and they, a lot of them give away their kind of sample what they did so you can build it for yourself if you want to. So. Yeah, they have a lot of different applications that you can use. Oh, it finally finished. All right. So you can see, again, this is pretty high density data, but we can look at the uh, green up and green down of this, this one site over the years and see how things have changed. There are some breaks, like when a camera went down and things like that, but I think it's really interesting to look at. Um, and honestly, I had fun going and looking at these really low green pictures um, and seeing like it's because a fog rolled in or something. I will stop sharing my screen. Um, and again, yeah, I just wanted to be here to answer any questions and show this off. I think it's really exciting. Um, and I think it makes using the clusters a lot more accessible. So I'm super happy that Evan and Ken took this on and were able to get this up and working. Um, but we are looking for any other interested parties who might have specific applications. Uh, they might not want me to say that, but we'll let you know if it's going to be really difficult to get to work um, or not. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I would like to know what applications people would like to use. And if they need some help with that, we can help get those on to open on demand. Uh, right now, we're just kind of taking some stabs in the dark, guessing uh, somebody would probably like to have our studio and somebody would probably like to have Jupyter Notebooks. So we're just kind of putting them together. If we had some direction, if somebody's interested in seeing something on here, it would help out. Image J, I thought that was one you were working on. Maybe I'm misremembering. It's not one that I'm familiar with, but okay. <laughs> maybe have, has looked at that. Yeah. I don't know if that's on our list to deploy in, in Oud right now, but um, I can definitely add it to our list of possible apps. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's a really good one to highlight. Thanks, Devin. Well, if nobody has any other questions, I'm happy to end this early. Um, I can also stick around if you want to talk more one on one. I'll be here. But thanks for joining me today. Um, if you have any questions about how to access this, please email me and let me know. I would love to work with you to figure out a way to get you on our systems.